Assalamu alaikum wa Hi everyone. Um, so I um, am sort of just off the back of submitting a manuscript for a book. <laughs> and this is a, a kind of look into uh, chapter 7 from that manuscript. Um, and it basically tries to look at a, a rather challenging question um, with respect to the nature of religious authority and how it's been affected after the Arab revolutions in particular. Um, I was just mentioning uh, in a sort of discussion earlier that I submitted the manuscript uh, yesterday and so I'm a little sort of like um, there's a bit of informational overload in my mind right now <laughs> having reread the whole thing uh, a couple of times in the last week um, and so uh, I would uh, sort of give that as a note of caution so I'm going to point at certain individuals uh, throughout this presentation and I might occasionally ask people in the audience if they recognize anyone. Does anyone recognize anyone on the screen by any chance? Um, at all? Please. It's not Ahmed al Tayyib, but it's a colleague of his. So the Ali Juma. So Ali Juma, he's you know he's Egyptian, so he's known as Ali Juma. That's the chap on the far left. In the middle is um, a UAE sort of religious official. And on the right, you have someone uh, known as Al-Habib Ali Al-Jifri. Um, so Ali Al-Jifri is the person on the right. Uh, so two Ali's on two sides. Um, and both of these scholars in uh, cer certain ways are quite uh, important political figures uh, in the Middle East. Um, and, and we'll sort of have a better look at them going forward. I wanted to just start off with a brief sort of definitional um, question, which is, um, I use certain terms in this presentation. One of them is uh, neo-traditionalism, uh, and they are kind of the, ce the center of my focus in this presentation. By neo-traditionalism, and sometimes I I've got Sadiq Hamid's book, which uh, you know, I'm sure a number of people in the room have read, um, Sufi Salafis and Islamists. Uh, I'm basically using neo-traditionalism <coughs> instead of Sufism, because I think Sufi is something which is, um, in some respects, shared by other denominations, potentially. It's, it's a very sort of like broad term, um, I would submit that later Sunni Islam is by default Sufi on some level. And so, um, and you know, I understand that Salafis would define themselves very often in opposition to Sufism, um, not always, uh, but certainly Islamists, many of them will have sort of Sufi links and, and heritage as well. So that's why I use neo-traditionalism. It's a term, incidentally, which has been used by someone called Abdullah bin Hamid Ali, uh, who's a scholar at Zaytuna College. Um, Zaytuna College is an institution that Hamza Yusuf um, and uh, sort of Hatim Bazian set up in California, a major institution of Islamic learning, kind of tries to hybridize traditional Islamic learning with a sort of Western curriculum to a certain extent. So um, what we have is neo-traditionalism uh, is a certain denomination which uh, is very often associated with the Azhar. I would say that it's associated really with the official Azhar institution. Um, so it very often is characterized by, for example, adherence to one of four schools of law, typically a preference for two schools of theology, um, the Ash'ari and the Maturidi schools of theology. And also, it valorizes Sufism, um, sometimes in the form of tariqas or you know, s spiritual orders. In um, contrast with them, I'm talking about Islamists and Salafis. So Islamists, I am saying, are people who have a link with the Muslim Brotherhood on some level. That's actually as sort of like, it's a fairly basic definition. I know some people um, sort of not agree with that definition. And I think um, I'm, I'm very deliberately sort of avoiding the uh, suggestion that Islamism is somehow um, politics in uh, Islam in politics, because I think everyone engages in politics on some level. Um, if we say Islamism is Islam in politics, then neo-traditionalists and, and Salafis cannot be uh, sort of labeled as non-Islamist, uh, in my view. And uh, finally, Salafis are, um, I'm using the term uh, in preference to the term Wahhabi. Wahhabi, um, you know, we live in a country with uh, the majority of Muslims coming from South Asian background and in South Asian uh, sort of like um, vernacular Wahhabi is quite an insult <laughs> so I avoid it personally but um, but they are uh, you know in a sense 21st century inheritors of the legacy of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab 
So these are three denominational terms that I'm using throughout this presentation. And the main focus of this presentation is the neo-traditionalist trend. And I have a, um, a picture of a number of scholars. Again, it's, um, it might not be terribly clear, uh, and I'll maybe articulate uh, who some of these people are. But I'm talking about these scholars in the context of the Arab revolutions, which um, you know, are started almost a decade ago now. So the Arab revolutions um, started in Tunisia, uh, in December 2010, a, a street vendor um, sort of in protest against his mistreatment by a police officer um, self-immolated. He burnt himself alive and subsequently died. And this sparked a sort of, uh, a, a, a sort of uprising within Tunisia that gradually overtook the country and forced out a dictator who'd been in power for nearly 40 years. Uh, known as Bin Ali. Uh, that happened in January, if I recall correctly, 14th of January. And then, um, you know, this was seen as inspiration for um, uprisings against dictators throughout the Middle East, uh, throughout the Arab world. And so um, Egypt started on the 25th of January with certain protests that very unexpectedly actually also unseated, uh, eventually unseated the um, dictator Hosni Mubarak at the time. Um, and what's of interest to me, Egypt is the most populous Arab country. Right now it has about 90 million people. Um, and it also is the seat of uh, the Azhar, which is an institution that I'll be referring to throughout this presentation. The Azhar, I should have had a slide for it, um, but uh, is arguably sort of the most recognizable institution uh, of learning within Sunni Islam. Uh, it was established about a thousand years ago, so it's older than Oxford or Cambridge or you know a lot of places, um, and uh, it it sort of has an aura of authority and Sunni legitimacy down to the present. Um, but a number of scholars associated with the Azhar, um, of you know, in this uh, picture you've got Ali Gumara over here and uh, Ahmed. Uh, next to him in the middle you have. Uh, Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al Bouti, a major Syrian scholar who passed in 2013. Um, both of them are graduates of the Azhar. Um, and you have a number of other scholars who are quite important. But uh, scholars associated with the Azhar in Egypt, uh, particularly Azhari officialdom, expressed um, quite vocally at certain points opposition to the um, uprisings against Hosni Mubarak. They were basically saying Hosni Mubarak is the legitimate leader of uh, Egypt. and uh, protests against him constitute haram rebellion, prohibited rebellion, uh, and uh, they used uh, the term haram, uh, which is obviously a Islamic legal term, uh, which uh, you know connotes that something is really unequivocally uh, impermissible. And so, um, after his eventual fall, um, they sort of uh, one of the things that the Mubarak government did, and uh, you know. Sisi's regime, which we'll talk about in a moment, also has reinstituted with only more severity, is they uh, basically treated uh, the Muslim Brotherhood as a banned organization and con considerably limited its operation uh, in society. Um, with the fall of Mubarak in February, uh, February the 11th, 2011, um, a space was kind of opened up for a moment for Islamists. And they were one of the most organized um, sort of forces in Egyptian society at the time. Um, they had, in many respects, set up a uh, sort of social infrastructure that was um, sort of making up for the failure of the state in various sectors, in the charitable sector, in the education sector, in the health sector, and so on. And so they actually had a considerable sort of like um, I infrastructure that could be called on to in some cases mobilize people. They have members uh, estimated at between 600 and 800,000 in Egypt. Um, and they also um, have a lot of, had a lot of goodwill at the time um, from a lot of people. And so they became a very quick uh, and effective um, socio-political force in Egypt once they had been legitimated. Um, uh, you know, before that, of course, they were banned, but they were still sort of like operating usually not in the name of the Muslim Brotherhood, but you know, it was known that these are institutions that are somehow affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood that are doing, uh, conducting social services of various kinds. Now, this brings us to our next slide. 
In 2012, um, a Muslim brother, uh, the chap in the middle, um, Mohammed Morsi, was elected to the presidency in Egypt. Um, and this is you know, quite a, a remarkable incident in the history of Egypt in, some, in many respects. But the two scholars on his side in this photo are the Sheikh al-Azhar, the sort of rector of the Azhar, and he's who's a state appointee and in a sense a, a political figure in Egypt. Uh, but also uh, in the modern Egyptian state, he's the most senior religious um, figure. Uh, and it's worth uh, reiterating that you know Islam this is something that everyone here will know, but Islam doesn't really recognize, Sunni Islam certainly, doesn't really recognize hierarchies in any formal sense that you might find in the Catholic Church, for example. And so um, Sheikh al uh, the Sheikh al Azhar's um, rank is really a function of his being a state functionary. That's something to bear in mind. And then you have next to him was at the time uh, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, who's kind of, I would say, second uh, only to Sheikh al Azhar. So he's uh, Egypt's most uh, sort of like significant legal authority. Um, it's worth pointing out that Ahmed al Tayyib was the Grand Mufti before he became Sheikh al Azhar. Um, so the Sheikh al Azhar, uh, you know, is also a, a legal authority. And so both of these figures continued to sort of, in many respects, agitate against the Muslim Brotherhood presidency. Um, and what's fascinating is these are people who were very pliant under the Mubarak regime. They uh, harbored a great deal of respect for Mubarak. Um, I mean, you can find videos of uh, Ali Goma on YouTube really sort of piling on the praise on Mubarak and his family. You know, these are the best people in Egypt uh, and its history or something along those lines. And, you know, similarly, Ahmed al-Tayyib um, was a you know, loyal member of the Mubarak uh, ruling party, the National Democratic Party, which was disbanded after the revolution. And, um, you know, notably he refused to sort of um, resign from his position in the party, which was a requirement of becoming the Sheikh al-Azhar until sort of there was, there was pressure, he was pressurized into doing that. And he resigned and he said, well, this resignation doesn't mean anything. My loyalty is to the NDP. So, you know, as well as being religious figures, these were very much loyal re regime loyalists. And so it's not entirely surprising that um, they would oppose the Muslim Brotherhood presidency. Um, in some respects, it's surprising because if you think about uh, the ideal that they would later espouse or claim to uphold, it was the notion that whoever's in authority needs to be shown respect. You need to obey those in power. This is kind of the, the Sunni, sort of the claimed Sunni doctrine that they would espouse. But in practice, of course, they were very selective in who they would apply that Sunni doctrine to. And so you have, um, you know, both uh, Ahmad al-Tayyib, you know, I, I mentioned a, a couple of instances in my book, but Ahmad al-Tayyib sort of um, actively tried to undermine uh, Morsi and uh, an then President Morsi in a few instances by sort of, in one instance, even resorting to the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces that was the de facto ruling power after the fall of Mubarak, meaning the uh, military generals who would eventually sort of uh, overthrow uh, the president. And so, you know, he, he would seek to uh, undermine uh, Morsi. And in a similar fashion, w there's a fascinating uh, Friday sermon on the part of uh, Ali Jumu'ah, I think it was on the 8th of June 2012, just a week and a half before the runoff election between Mohamed Morsi and the military's preferred candidate, um, the last appointed sort of prime minister of Mubarak, uh, someone called Ahmed Shafiq. And so uh, Ali Jumu'ah goes on a Friday khutbah and he basically uh, sets out a vigorous attack without naming him against Mohammed Morsi, saying that this person has no sort of like um, religious bona fides, he has great arrogance before God and so on. And the person who is closer to God is, uh, is the other person, he doesn't name him either. The papers obviously, I mean, they understood who he was talking about, it was reported on the <laughs> next day that, you know, uh, Ali Jumar comes out in support, uh, attacks Morsi and comes out in support of Ahmed Shafiq and attacked, he also attacked actually um, one of the sister institutions of the Azhar, uh, which was Egypt's largest charitable in organization, Al Jamiya Al Khairiya, which had actually made you know made a decision to say that you know we actually support 
uh, Morsi. Um, he fascinatingly uh, sort of said that this is completely against the neutrality of state institutions. And in that khutbah, he went on and vigorously attacked Morsi. <laughs> so he obviously, <laughs> and, and said that the other person was closer to God. Um, Ahmed Shafiq was closer to God. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I, I use a term that is taken from anthropology, um, uh, the trickster. So my colleague, um, an anthropologist uh, at Oxford, Walter Armbrust, has recently written a book about Egypt called Martyrs and Tricksters. And uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, things that he talks about is the emergence of tricksters in liminal spaces uh, or spaces of liminality. Um, and, uh, and I basically am saying that Ali Juma is an example of a trickster alim. Um, and so it is not entirely sort of unsurprising. This is not, you know, not my graphic, something I found online. But um, this is a, someone <laughs> made a rather unflattering sort of image of Ali Guma calling him Mufti al-Askar, the army's Mufti. Um, because what happens uh, th in the following years is truly shocking. Um, and uh, Ali Guma essentially um, comes out in support of a coup that is undertaken um, by the military regime in July of 2013, so a year, on a year anniversary of Morsi's presidency, and he had, you know, really had a hobbled experience as a president. Um, state institutions weren't in his favor, and he was also, um, you know, not, shall we say, not terribly charismatic. Um, there were, and there are interesting reasons historically why he ended up being the president or, or the selected sort of candidate of the Muslim Brotherhood. But Ali Juma actually came out uh, and uh, it was sub subsequently leaked that in probably around Ju uh, late July 2013, this was leaked in uh, August, that he had been giving lectures to the army saying that you are entirely in the right and you have every right to confront protesters against uh, the coup with gunfire, uh, including killing them. Because these people are, uh, you know, and, and the way this was framed, and, and this was a kind of a joint effort on the part of um, state institutions, um, was to say that these protesters against the coup are actually armed terrorists. This was the narrative that was pervaded throughout Egypt and Egyptian media at the time. And so in, <coughs> in keeping with that, sorry, Ali Juma basically um, uh, presents a picture of and he quotes extensively from Qur'an and Hadith, so he develops a religious argument. Um, this is again an instance where I say that, well, Ali Juma is an Islamist because he's using, it, if we define Islamist as you know, someone who is employing uh, religious discourse in, uh, to political ends, Ali Juma is a textbook case of an Islamist, and that's why I think these terms are problematic in the way that they're very often used. But he basically used religious um, sort of arguments and legal justifications, Islamic legal justifications. And he was, of course, a very senior religious authority in, uh, and a legal authority in Egypt to say, um, you know, that these people are ultimately confronting um, the legitimacy of the state and they are dangerous threats to our, the stability of the nation. And so uh, the language he uses is that uh, is from a hadith which is in Bukhari and I believe in Muslim. Uh, Bukhari is the most canonical sort of like collection of hadiths in the Sunni uh, tradition. So it's a prophetic statement where the Prophet says, if a person comes uh, and, tr uh, you know, when you're all unified under a leader and tries to sow dissension among you, and it's understood historically as being someone who's coming and trying to um, engage in treasonous actions against uh, the ruler, kill them, whoever they may be. So if someone comes and tries to sow dissension among you, kill them. But he interestingly takes this and basically applies it to anyone who's protesting against. So he, he pluralizes it in a sense. So anyone who's protesting, and at this point, um, there were estimates of tens of thousands and according to some, even hundreds of thousands of anti-coup protesters, um, particularly at a place called Rabah Square. And so um, at that point, he basically uh, tells them that you have the, l the right to confront these people militarily. Um, later, after on the sort of, I, I should go forward a slide and talk about the Rabah massacre, uh, which is really like, um, it's one of the most significant events in modern Egyptian history. Um, it was on the 14th of August, 2013. Um, 
in just one square, it's estimated that uh, well over a, mil a thousand people ha had been killed. Um, a lot of them had been uh, sort of killed with shots to the head, upper torso, the neck. Um, and so they were very deliberate kill shots. Human Rights Watch, which did um, an extensive report on the massacre published a year later, um, talks about, you know, their weapons specialist said that, you know, there are clear, there's clear evidence that people were basically being um, used, uh, fired up on using sniper fire. So, you know, these had to be optically sort of stabilized, um, you know, advanced weaponry that's designed for that sort of assault. And there were lots of reports of uh, sniper fire, even from helicopters and rooftops and so on. And um, David Kirkpatrick, who is a New York Times journalist, was actually in the square on that day. <laughs> really incredible. He and a colleague. Um, and uh, he reports that you know, soldiers were coming in with Kalashnikovs. If anyone knows you know, uh, what a Kalashnikov is, I mean, it's really a sort of like serious, deadly assault rifle used in warfare. Um, you know, if it's uh, in certain circumstances, it, it can give up to 100 rounds a minute. You know, it's, it, these are sort of like weapons of war, which were being sort of uh, used against armed, uh, all overwhelmingly unarmed protesters. Um, the Egyptian state afterwards said, having, you know, declared that all of these people had been uh, heavily armed, and that's what they told the soldiers, you know, to charge them up, so to speak. And, uh, and that's why the soldiers really were unrelenting on that day. Uh, later said that we found 15 um, guns, you know, in the square. And, uh, you know, implausibly, they said, uh, they basically ran off with all the other weapons. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, like this. but as David Kirkpatrick was saying that, you know, uh, he went on multiple occasions and tried to look for weapons within the square and found none. Um, and this is what, you know, all uh, the international independent observers had mentioned as well. Um, Human Rights Watch also mentions the dead were you know, bulldozed and in some cases incinerated because they, you know, burned all the tents and a lot of these tents had dead bodies within them. So it was really like, uh, you know, uh, David Kirkpatrick in his Into the Hands of Soldiers gives a very harrowing account of it um, and it's worth reading. Um, but I should go back briefly. Four days after the Rabah massacre and there was international outrage, understandably, um, although, I mean, like, I comment, like, states didn't really sort of say anything meaningful about it. They just said, oh, this was a terrible thing to happen. Why did you do this? And then they continued as usual. And, um, you know, the UAE actually had, uh, we'll talk about the UAE briefly. Uh, hopefully I'll have a bit of time. Uh, but the UAE, um, the United Arab Emirates in particular, uh, was lobbying heavily in Washington to make sure that there was no sort of, like, negative fallout for the Egyptians, for the Egyptian military. But four days after the Rabah massacre on the 18th of August, Ali Juma again went before uh, a military audience, uh, this time in the presence of General al-Sisi, the Minister of Interior, uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, who was the main architect of the Rabah massacre, and um, maybe about a thousand um, army officers. And um, he basically uh, you know, praised them to the heavens and said, you're, you're on the right path, and anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. And you know, at this point, he just lost uh, any restraint. He was basically saying, if anyone c confronts you, shoot to kill. <laughs> he used language like that. And uh, he called them trash, and he said, these, these people are, you know, stinking. You know, that's the sort of language he used. It's a very genocidal kind of language. Mm -hmm. He spoke for about 40 minutes. Um, and again, this was leaked afterwards. Um, this was not leaked, actually, for about six weeks after the events. And, um, you know, it's... It's fascinating to see how uh, someone like uh, Ali Jumara sort of responds to this. You know, after it was leaked, he was saying, oh, I was talking about sort of like terrorists in the Sinai <laughs> or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's completely implausible uh, given the extent to which he is, you know, talking about circumstances that have taken place. You know, he, he very explicitly specifies, you know, the, the terrible um, people we've confronted over the last four days. And he mentions those days. Um, and he also talks about, you know, these people and their claims of democracy and, and the only people, the, the terrorists in the Sinai were actually celebrating to a certain extent. I mean, they were basically saying, yes, no more elections after, you know, the sort of um, the, the coup had taken place. And, and they st it basically reignited the insurgency in the Sinai um, in July that year. Now, I'm wondering how I'm doing for time. Uh, I think I'm okay. Yeah.
Um, you can sort of let me know if I'm... So now we talk about the crisis in religious authority. We can understand that you know, this is pretty serious stuff. I mean, it's not going to... It, it shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, and uh, basically what really precipitates the crisis uh, is the leaking of some of these videos. Because Ali Joma had had a public discourse talking about um, you know, uh, the sort of protests and the Egyptian coup before um, sort of these leaked videos came out. And in that public discourse, he was a lot more conciliatory. He was basically saying, well, you know, the Egyptian army, they're very, you know, they're the pride of Egypt and, you know, we should support them. And we ask, uh, you know, God to guide the Muslim brothers, you know. And uh, I mean, it, some of the language is really um, fascinating because he's saying, you know, uh, these people, uh, you know, they have the best of intentions, but, you know, they've, they've got things wrong and so on. But um, once these sorts of videos are leaked where he's saying shoot to kill <laughs> and he's basically, you know, um, ad really celebrating uh, the, you know, saying things like, you know, the, the righteous have seen multiple dreams that have vindicated your actions and saying things, things like this to the army. Um, uh, and so what happens to a certain extent, does anyone know who Ali al-Jifri is? Al-Habib Ali al-Jifri. He sometimes actually comes to the UK, unfortunately. But um, he, uh, he is someone who uh, is, he considers himself a student of uh, Ali Jumar. Uh, he's um, much younger than him, maybe 20 years his junior, um, and is a Yemeni scholar based in the Un United Arab Emirates. But he, um, immediately after the first leaks come out, which are less incendiary, and they come out just after the Rabah massacre, um, he uh, sort of reports go around saying, oh, Ali Jumar gave a fatwa to kill because he had quoted a hadith saying, you know, if people, uh, if someone comes and you, you're unified uh, with respect to, a, you know, your leader, then kill that person. And so this was understood as a fatwa to kill. And he immediately goes on to social media and he says, this is complete lie and fabrication. This is Ali Al-Jifri speaking, so his, uh, Ali Jumar's student. Um, then, uh, you know, Ali Jumar gives a public interview where he very directly, this is on the 23rd of um, August, so it's nine days afterwards. Incidentally, we know that on the 18th of August, he's spoken to the army and said, shoot to kill. But this isn't known in public, right? So in the public interview, uh, nine days afterwards, he kind of takes a middle ground between the um, sort of incitement that he gives on the 18th and the sort of um, conciliatory talk that he'd been uh, giving earlier. So in this uh, public interview, he starts saying, actually, anyone who confronts the Egyptian army, their haqquhum fi shari'ati al-qatl, you know, their sort of like uh, legal desert in the sharia ah is to be killed. Okay. Um, and then he explains this is if they're carrying weapons and all of these sorts of things. But, um, you know, in a sense, uh, now he is actually articulating explicitly that, yes, there are certain circumstances where you can kill. So he can, he's giving a fatwa to kill in a sense, um, but he's, it's a qualified fatwa. So then Ali al-Jifri comes and he makes another statement and he says, as m you know, our great sheikh has clarified, this was never a fatwa to kill unarmed protesters or anything like that, or you know, no one was going to kill uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. This was a fatwa to legitimate the killing of um, terrorists or something along those lines, people who are, and then he, you know, goes off and, and says that, but all of these hypocrites are going around slandering the great sheikh, and these are all little people trying to speak uh, ill of great people, and so on. So he, he becomes quite, he kind of goes on the offensive as well. Um, now, uh, what can I say? Uh, I, I, I've added here that al Jifri would later uh, and he did this in the UK on two occasions uh, that I've come across. Um, he wouldn't see it as beneath himself to go and sort of slander <laughs> senior scholars of other denominations. So Yusuf al-Qaradawi, who's a, a major Egyptian scholar who had been very supportive of the uh, Arab revolutions and he was himself a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Ali al-Jifri would come to the UK um, and Wala al-Qawaisi uh, talks about this in her dissertation which is not published unfortunately but it, you can check it in the library in Oxford. Um, she talks about uh, attending a retreat in 2014 and I have a further report of someone attending a retreat 
in 2015 giving this, with Ali al-Jifri giving the same message. That Ali al-Jifri said that Yusuf Qaradawi gave a fatwa um, a week before, uh, a week before is the report from 2015, Wala does not say this, but gave a fatwa uh, that, was, uh, that said that you could kill the ulama and then someone killed al-Buti al uh, a week later. Okay. This happens to be sort of, uh, uh, I would say it happens to be a fabrication. So uh, Al-Qaradawi was asked, you know, can we target the ulama? This was in December 2012 um, in an open fatwa session on Al Jazeera. And his response was, we should fight anyone who is supporting the Assad regime. Okay. It's not really saying that you should kill or target ulama. It was kind of a more general statement that was made uh, addressing other parts of that question. And so, um, but Ali al-Jifri would later present this in spiritual retreats in the UK as being a case of al-Qaradawi gave a fatwa and al-Buti was killed as a result of it. Okay. Um, and he also uh, reiterated sort of state propaganda in Egypt, which was to say that the Muslim Brotherhood were burning the bodies of the dead in Rabah and framing the state. I mean, it really is like another level of imagination uh, and hysteria, in a sense, to believe these sorts of things. But these are the sorts of messages that he was giving. Um, you know, I think it's, to a certain extent, a scandal that he should be invited by Muslims in the UK. And I think part of the reason this happens is because Muslims are quite uninformed about these sorts of things. And that's part of the reason, actually, why I'm writing about uh, this sort of a topic. But it is, obviously, a very serious matter. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I mention in my book is that um, you know, Al-Jifri does not feel any sense of compunction of a sort of a, a young person going against a senior scholar when it comes to Yusuf al-Qaradawi, but he will, uh, and he does not seek to, uh, you know, verify the information. Uh, there's, uh, there's a verse of the Qur'an which is often in, uh, invoked in these sorts of uh, uh, situations. It's in Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, idha ja'akum fasikum binaba'in fatabayyanu. Uh, those, oh you who believe, if a uh, sort of uh, morally depraved person comes to you with some sort of information, then check whether it's true, verify it. And so he quoted that when accusations were made against Ali Jumu'ah. Ah. But uh, in a sense, he should have thought of that when he was making those accusations against uh, other scholars. Um, and so he, uh, Hamza Yusuf, incidentally, so this is the Western connection. Uh, Ali Al Jifri coming to the UK is one Western connection, but. But Hamza Yusuf is a you know a very influential scholar uh, in the West, someone who influenced me as a teenager, uh, and in many respects led me to go into Islamic studies. Um, but he also he, in my view, um, sort of uh, defends Jumaa's standing as a as a mufti. So not necessarily justifying the sort of Rabah massacre or anything like this. I I know of no instance where Hamza Yusuf has sort of made a, an explicit statement about the Rabah massacre. But he does, and this is an anxiety about, you know, religious authority. Because if you start attacking the ulama, you know, that's a, a serious threat to the understanding of religious authority in the Islamic tradition. And so Hamza Yusuf actually defends Ali Juma even after the Rabah massacre. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to uh, maybe take another 10 minutes or so, hopefully. Um, but yeah, that's okay. okay. Um, and so, uh, I just wanted to talk about how um, the counter-revolutionary context after 2013 uh, really sort of like uh, the institutionalization of counter-revolutionary forces in the Middle East starts to become established. And so in this picture you have Ahmed al-Tayyib, the Shaykh al-Azhar on the left, with um, Abdullah bin Bayya, one of the most senior scholars in the Middle East, uh, and a teacher of Hamza Yusuf. And on that side, Abdullah bin Zayed, uh, who is the foreign minister of um, uh, the sort of uh, United Arab Emirates. Now, the UAE foreign minister is a fascinating uh, sort of political animal. He's someone who, ha nine months after the Rabah massacre, um, you know, he had provided the funding that allowed for Abdullah bin Bayya to set up um, <coughs> an, an Orwellian sort of institution, in my opinion called the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But it's supposed to, right? And uh, nine months earlier, he had been visiting Egypt, visiting the generals in Egypt in the week before the Rabah massacre, telling them, crush these people, okay? We have your back in Washington, crush these people. 
and we're going to fund you uh, if Washington stops any sort of like financial aid. They had military aid deals with Egypt for a long time, which ultimately they didn't stop anyway. So it wasn't really a concern. But the Emirates and Saudi Arabia have just poured in money. Uh, it's understood to be uh, maybe north of $40 billion uh, over the period of two years that followed. Uh, and it continues, I think, to this day. But, uh, you know, Abdullah bin Zayed is directly implicated in the Rabah massacre, according to David Kirkpatrick of the New York Times. And he is someone who is, you know, very, I think, careful about his sources. Um, and he had, of course, funded, I mean, this is, I didn't mention this, but he had funded the rebellion that had, you know, presented itself as a grassroots rebellion that ultimately overthrew uh, Morsi in the first place. That started around March of 2013. So then he funds Abdullah bin Bayer, um, who used to work as the vice president of the International Union of Muslim Scholars uh, with Yusuf al-Qaradawi. He poaches him from that union, sets up a counter institution called the Forum for Promoting Peace in Muslim Societies in the Emirates in March of 2014. And they begin promoting a discourse of democracy is bad and you should obey your rulers. Uh, no matter what they do, and you have no circumstances in which you can disobey them. Hamza Yusuf, in March 2014, uh, gave a lecture where he was talking about how the, uh, the ruler is God's shadow, and so you cannot sort of, um, uh, you know, he, he says in this fascinating sort of line that, and he's quoting uh, sort of uh, canonical phrases, he's saying that there's, yes, we all know that there is no uh, obedience to a ruler, in disobedience to God, but the ruler is God's shadow. <laughs> right. Okay, and so Hamza Yusuf is also caught up in this. He incidentally had, in the lead up to this, already started articulating an anti-democratic sort of orientation. So he, in an interview in 20, I want to say late 2011, so this is even in the first year of the Arab revolutions, had already been speaking about, you know, my preferred form of uh, sort of uh, governance is um, constitutional monarchy. Okay. I don't think democracies are good. Um, but then it's not the sort of constitutional monarchy we have in the UK. God save the Queen, right? Um, <laughs> you know, this is a symbolic constitutional monarchy. Um, the head of state is, in a sense, vestigial. The power, in many respects, really resides in number 10. But Hamza Yusuf uh, basically said, no, we want um, the king to have executive authority because we're in times of crisis and that requires executive authority. It's a wonderful excuse um, for autocracy. And so um, he also joins, Hamza Yusuf also joins the um, forum as the um, sort of <coughs> uh, vice president uh, to uh, Abdullah bin Baya. Now, neo-traditionalist critics have been quite muted in the West, in my experience. I, you know. I didn't necessarily mention this at the beginning, but I'm sort of trained in a seminary and I would consider myself as having been trained in a neo-traditionalist sort of like curriculum myself. So I consider myself a neo-traditionalist alim, as it were. But I also come from a tradition of scholarship which is quite sort of like open. I think, um, you know, seminary training is almost by default neo-traditionalist. Um, but as a consequence, my teachers actually actively encouraged me to sort of try and seek out other, what I've called Sunni denominations and learn from them. And so I have teachers from all three Sunni denominations that I've mentioned here. But um, neo-traditionalists uh, I have privately spoken to have expressed concern about uh, you know, the actions of these scholars. But very few have articulated these in public. And I think that this is something which is um, a, a serious problem in some respects. Um, so most critics of counter-revolutionary scholars have come out from outside neo-traditionalist circles. And in my view, that in some respects can be easily dismissed by neo-traditionalism as a sort of orientation or as a denomination. A possible exception could, might be um, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad or Tim Winter at Cambridge, who has hinted at criticisms in sort of public uh, writings and in sort of uh, public lectures. But they're very sort of, um, they're allusions rather than very explicit criticisms. And sometimes they're directed at non-neo-traditionalist actors, um, you know, who are also complicit in similar sort of counter-revolutionary uh, activities. Another muted critic, in my view, has been um, uh, someone called Hisham Hellier, H.A. Hellier, uh, who has, in my 
own sort of personal assessment papered over uh, what Ali Guma has done. So I'll just briefly conclude with this, and hopefully I've not gone on too long. Um, Hisham Helia, who's actually a friend, um, is a scholar. Again, he's kind of a dually trained scholar in a sense. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Warwick um, and is a social scientist, but also uh, a sort of Islamic scholar. And he basically wrote a piece in 2014 called Egypt Killed Islam in the West. Uh, I mean, he's, it's in quotes. He's quoting someone and he kind of tries to argue that this is uh, overstating the case, but, you know, th that there are people who are critiquing people like Ali Jumu'ah, um, you know, for his support of the Morsi government, sorry, of the Sisi regime, the Sisi coup regime. Um, but, um, you know, the people who are critiquing um, Sisi and Ali Jumu'ah are themselves inconsistent in who they critique. They don't look at their own selves and see what sort of problems they have. And in my view, this essay, uh, it papers over um, sort of the real issues at stake. And I think it does this, um, this is my contention, uh, because uh, of a kind of intra-denominational, interest in the intra-denominational sectarian, quasi-sectarianism. So I don't want to say sectarian outright, but it's a quasi-sectarianism because there is an assumption very often within these sort of various denominations that we're the true Sunnis and the others are kind of like they're not they're not they've not got it completely right and so that uh, when taken to extremes can actually result in this sort of bloodshed in my view because some of the discourse and this is something I argue in a slightly uh, in an already published piece in a volume um, recently published called uh, Global Sufism yeah, in a chapter called um, sort of uh, Arab Sufis and, uh, sorry, um, I should remember the title of this, it's been a long day, um, but uh, <laughs> Sufism and Arab politics, something along those lines. Um, again, I sort of like do qualify my use of the term Sufi in that, uh, in the essay, but uh, mm. some of these people, uh, not necessarily Ali Jumu'ah, who I don't think was necessarily sort of held back by moral qualms of any sort, uh, a lot of people were concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood, the bro brotherhoodization of Islam in Egypt. And they were concerned for the true authentic Sunni sort of uh, ideals being preserved. And so I wanted to sort of close by just problematizing this image of um, these denominations as really being very distinct. Because ultimately they are, in my estimation, all part of the Sunni discursive tradition. Okay. And they borrow from each other, and they learn from each other, and they critique each other. You know, we, we hear a lot about the critiques, but we don't hear about the borrowing very often. Sometimes in good ways, sometimes in maybe not so good ways, depending on one's perspective. So, as I say, neo-traditionalism is imbricated with other denominations in modern Islam. Policing boundaries in this way can be deadly, as we've seen. So critiques, uh, you know, Helia critiques Al-Qaradawi as a non-normative sort of like uh, Sunni meaning he's not really a neo-traditionalist. He doesn't use the term traditionalist, but uh, he uses the term normative, which is, again, problematic, because you're basically saying we're the correct Sunni form. Um, and so, uh, and he appears to say that, you know, uh, Qaradawi holds certain problematic positions. And Qaradawi is particularly well known in the West for holding an opinion that suicide bombing in Palestine is legitimate. Okay, this was very controversial in the 2000s. Um, it happens to be the case that in 2016, he you know, publicly said, I don't hold this opinion anymore, and I don't think it's appropriate. But um, it also happens to be the case that the Sheikh Al-Azhar and Ali Jumu'ah both support suicide bombings. And Ali Jumu'ah has himself, I, I think this goes back to the 90s, you know, made pretty uh, ex um, extreme sort of articulation of this, where he said, anyone who insists that it's not legitimate is a kafir. <laughs> right? Okay, um, and uh, the same, not in such strident terms, but the same is true for Ahmed al-Tayyib, the current Sheikh al-Azhar. The same happens to be true for the last three Sheikhs al-Azhar before him. <coughs> okay, so the Azhar, in a sense, is the most noted upholder of suicide bombings as a legitimate uh, form of resistance in Palestine. Right? So the exceptionalization of you know, neo-traditionalism uh, neo as being Sunni orthodoxy, but also you know, upholding a pluralistic sort of non-violent form of Islam has to be um, also critiqued. Uh, I'll close with just one other point, which is, um, you know, Halia critiques Muhammad Abdul, who's a kind of reformist figure in Egypt, and says that he's the sort of inspiration that gave rise to groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and 
And these are kind of like modernistic uh, oriented and non, non-traditional Sunni. But his own sort of, the scholar he is defending, Ali Juma, also upholds and valorizes the uh, teachings of Muhammad Abdu and has published his work, uh, uh, produced editions of his work. So I think, um, and there are various other ways which we can talk about this. Sufism, you know, Al-Qaradawi is, you know, I think uh, as much a Sufi as someone like um, Al-Buti. Um, he is also uh, as much an Azhari as any of these people. He graduated top of his class in the Azhar, both as an undergraduate and a postgraduate, right? Um, and so, you know, to, to suggest that these are, uh, policing the boundaries, I think, are very problematic and in some cases deadly. Sorry for going on for quite so long, but I hope that was interesting. All right, thank you.